Well, it was road trip time yesterday, Chris. Sure, that was a heck of a road trip. Yeah, we drove up from Raleigh, North Carolina, and here we are in Lexington this morning, Kentucky. Yeah, and we discovered something called the snake. The snake. It was the uh, very, very windy, twisty, was it Tennessee mountain road? I think it was Tennessee. It was it was the perfect road for us that we just accidentally stumbled across. Yeah. Alex's we, tires are designed to stick to the road. <laughs> just well, I mean, you did that. You just described all tires ever, but <laughs> I know um, I'm not very, I'm not a tire guy. Anyway, the, the reason that we took this, this road trip and a nine, 10 hour drive from Raleigh was to spend a bit of time with Wendell who joins us today. Hello, Wendell. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you doing? Oh, not too bad. Although it is a little weird. I mean, like podcast technology, I would think with, you know, since Alexander Graham Bell, you guys would not have to come here, but I'm glad you did. <laughs> That's true. I had, I had that realization on about hour three of the flight. I was like, oh, well, yeah. you know, we, we could have done Skype, <laughs> <laughs> but this is a lot more fun. I mean, then we got to see the grand tour. Yeah. You get uh, to see, we're going to do an office tour at some point on the level one channel very soon because the renovation is basically done like you could there's a few rough things we got to work on but basically the renovation's done it's pretty presentable there is something special about actually connecting in meat space yeah Mm -hmm. which you just don't get over i mean i've watched chris i've watched your channel for a while and wendell i've watched yours probably for just as long um going way way back and i know you cover all sorts of technology and and stuff like that but you generally tend to focus on the nerdier side of things, I think it's fair to say. So, uh, <laughs> look at this thing that I gave a large part of my life into figuring out. <laughs> this was a terrible, terrible experience. Suffer along with me. I think that's an accurate statement for a lot of what we're trying to do with this show, right? Right. right yeah. Is yeah, I've put some blood, sweat, and, and a lot of alcohol into this project. And <laughs> <laughs> I want you to come along for that ride with me. So, yeah. We thought it would be a good topic for our, this is our second episode as we record. We thought just the discussion of why self-host is sort of a meta conversation. And that's why the tour of your space here was pretty perfect because there is clearly some stuff you've chosen to spend the extra time to build local infrastructure, put high-speed networking in, lots of disk. And then there's some things, which we don't know about yet, that you alluded to that you've chosen to host in the cloud. Um, So I'm kind of curious what, like, the Wendell take is on why self-hosting is important. I think that like for the individual, um, self-hosting is never more accessible than it's, than it's ever been. And I think that it going forward, um, self-hosting makes a lot of sense because like the, the reason that you don't want to self-host, I think is one of convenience. So like you look at Google and, and like Gmail, it's like Gmail is super convenient. You just load a browser and there it is. But the technology has moved on to the point that, that's basically become a commodity and we could talk like, I don't want to get like super into the weeds here, but things like containerization technologies mean that individuals are better able to access Google levels of technology running on a raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. And so, well, running on a raspberry Pi might not be the best user experience, but it's possible to have an even better user experience than quote unquote, the cloud, even if you're rolling your own cloud or doing a private cloud. And because you're giving somebody money for the service, they're not having to mine your data in order to earn money. Right. Now, I did notice a lot of disk, but you said some of that disk was to actually back up the stuff you do keep in the cloud. Yeah. So I'm always paranoid that something's going to go wrong in the cloud. Like, you know, Microsoft had that major DNS outage in mm-hmm. Azure. And so mm-hmm. it's like, is that is that going to happen? There's a, a backup provider for dental, like their specialization is like dental offices. So you've got HIPAA and things like that. And this is just last week. And the organization that provides the backups in the cloud was hit by ransomware. And it's like, oh, we all laugh. It's like, oh, this is, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's incompetence. But happens though. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you have things like the OPM hack, like Mm -hmm. the hardware was defective from the beginning. So you know how you make sure it's safe is you have an offline backup that's inaccessible. Yeah, and there is something to be in a smaller target. If it's you know on your LAN, you are one person amongst millions of nodes on the internet. But if you're uh, Azure in this case or another large provider, you've got a pretty big target on your back too. So there's that. There's a different risk profile. There's like a different set of risks. Like you still have to keep your system secure yeah. and make sure your firewalls you know, set up right. And you're not just letting anybody in, but in a way you're also kind of just one of many. You're sort of lost in the noise. That's one of the things I like about containerization is because it offers the possibility of somebody to set up an automation system, like just a very basic Docker, you know, scrape and rebuild on a timer um, Mm. would let you keep the patches and security and still do local hosting and probably be pretty safe as long as the container that you're using 
is maintained by people that, that know what they're doing. Of course, like depending on if the, if the container is not well maintained or there's like an open source supply chain attack, then that's a whole other risk profile as well. So what containers do you use like uh, for, for backup? Well, it, like we would have a replication of like whatever the thing is. So like if there was a very important website that we were hosting, um, we've actually been doing a lot of work lately in taking traditional CMSs and making them headless. So like with Drupal, for example, it is very easy, not very easy, but we can fairly easily add an interface to the JSON API so that Drupal, a traditional CMS, which is actually kind of slow and kind of clunky, especially version 8, but we can take the content from that, export it as flat files, and then everything is perfectly fine to run on like Amazon S3 and CloudFront. And then when somebody has a content update, it just regenerates the flat files. And I think this kind of thing with a service layer on top of it is probably the future of websites. So if you have a very large website that needs to be very, very resilient, you can have your traditional hosting thing, but like your backup plan can be the series of flat files or the main hosting can be a series of flat files. And then it's like, oh, something went horribly wrong. It's like, okay, well, let's just make the change in DNS and like Amazon could be on fire. We, we, don't, we don't care. We could roll it out at Akamai. We could roll it out at, at Linode. We could roll it out, you know, uh, Cloudflare could provide services. It's, it's really... When you're dealing with it at that level, the service provider no longer matters. Mm-hmm. Are you not tempted to do like this this new? Because you just have a, a video come out about DevOps, yeah, a DevOps workstation. Uh, are you not tempted to do stuff in Lambda? You know, have these functions that are just very single purpose? Or yeah, no, you totally could. Uh, there, it's funny. We actually do have some things that are are running in Lambda. So like a, a customer comes along and wants to do a job, and it'll just spin up in Lambda, do its thing, and then the output is added to the collective, mm. and that's that's totally fine. Like that's a that's mm-hmm. a perfectly reasonable way um, to design things. That functionally. I mean, it's way different under the hood, but functionally, that's where a lot of DevOps is going because, like, our local DevOps server, uh, Kubernetes, is doing a lot of stuff. So, like, a developer checks in a bunch of stuff, a VM is stood up, and a whole bunch of things happen in Kubernetes, and uh, uh, and then all of that goes away when they're done. Well, actually, it sticks around for like a week just in case we need it. Mm-hmm. But then after a week, like, whatever that temporal thing is is was was gone, and this actually has worked out really well. There's a particular project in mind where the the client is very hard to work with, and they've got their own like chef automation. And so, like, even if we just add an SSH key to the very like this like the two vCPU instances on Amazon, which is not really enough for what they want to do, uh, you know, chef comes along and just clobbers that periodically. And so, we've set up um, continuous integration and a Kubernetes thing so that it actually will spin up something that works kind of like the Amazon EC2 instance. Uh, but it it has a way more CPU and memory horsepower. It does all of the work that it needs to in that temporal VM. And it, really, it's just a container in Kubernetes. And then it pushes from that Kubernetes container to that really just awful, terrible EC2 instance. And so <laughs> it doesn't matter if they come along and clobber it later. It doesn't matter if they come and, and delete the, the SSH keys. It just It just doesn't matter. So how do you decide which services get that treatment and which services end up in your closet downstairs well a lot of the see it's uh, i would say that that exists in both places like it would not work without the closet and it would not work without the cloud services you get sort of the best of both worlds yeah if the cloud service goes away it's really easy easy for us to redeploy somewhere else and if the closet goes away we've got time to restore from offsite backups and do whatever we need to do without anybody that's in production really realizing what's happened i think we need to rename the show chris closet hosting <laughs> <laughs> it is you know what there's a, there's something to it there because it's a nice perfect sweet spot i really like that cuz you're not dependent on any one cloud provider yeah and you're not absolutely dependent on your office space being online 24/7 if you have to take something down to install something new in the rack or move it yeah cuz let's face it you know as, as you know, experienced as you clearly are, you're not a data center. You no. don't have techs here 24-7. You don't have all the monitoring that they do, the security protocols that they do to even get on the floor. <laughs> Although yeah. when you deal with people actually in the data center, it's less than impressive. <laughs> True. <laughs> I've got a failed hard drive. I need that replaced. Do what now? I can, uh-huh. ha- I can hammer the front of the surfer with a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, very fr- it's a very frustrating experience. Um, so uh, we're here at your, uh, your space. What, what about like your home setup? Do you have storage systems at home? Do you have a big like home server setup or do you keep it lean at home tech-wise? Uh, home is, is very lean. Uh, it's, it's a similar philosophy. Uh, 
but um, I have an ITX system that is in the Fractal Node 304, mm. and it's a four processor, eight thread system right now. But it's very soon going to be the as soon as as soon as I get a 3950X from AMD, it's going to be a 16 core AM4 mm. system. I thought about replacing it with Threadripper, but it's really overkill for for what I do at home. But the the home system runs a number of VMs. There's an IoT gateway because all the IoT devices are on a completely separate network. And the IoT devices, I run more homegrown IoT devices than real, like third party IoT devices. Hey, what's an example of that? Um, the uh, system for opening the garage door mm. um, is hooked into the lights. So, like where my house is, there's a light that's like right at the road because there's a little bit of a driveway. And then there are lights on the garage and there are lights on the house. And so, there's a receiver at the light post when you first enter the driveway that picks up the the Bluetooth MAC address of my phone. And so when I drive by the light post, it will turn the lights on if it's after dark at the um, uh, at the garage and a house. Hmm. So the IoT gateway for that cannot get on the internet. Chris just for the listeners looked at me and <laughs> winked because that was that's a phenomenal piece of engineering. Yeah, that's great. Like, it's just an idea I wouldn't have thought of. And are you battery powering that thing out there, or did you run power out to the no, remote? It's it's Raspberry. It's a Raspberry Pi Zero ah. in, in epoxy, mm. and so it literally is just <laughs> doing its thing out there with Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi from the house is strong enough to make it out there. That's okay. great. I mean, it's only like one megabit, but that's enough to send the packet to be like, turn the lights on. It's yeah. dark. That's all you need, really. That's a great solution. And so you do have some level. Of presence awareness so the system knows specifically it's you yeah that's really nice did i hear you mention home assistant yeah i've been so uh, the home assistant conversation is complicated it's broken right now mm. um but historically i've had the home assistant doing fun things like scouring the internet for certain things that i might be interested in that are temporal there's a plex server that's a part of that so you know like plex mm -hmm. um and historically although not currently I've had um, an MPEG-2 capture box that was hooked into the um, the listings for cable TV, and so like historically, it would it's like okay, probably interested in Star Trek, probably interested in all these things, <laughs> and I could get to that from my phone and just tag shows that I that I might be interested in. So like for Game of Thrones, it would you know DVR it for me, mm -hmm. but then that goes into Plex, and so that's nice. another like kind of cloud, kind of not really thing, mm -hmm. like. Plex's model has changed over the years. I'm not really super happy with their their subscription model. It's still probably worth it, but it's super easy to run all of your media center at home and actually stream it yourself over your internet connection. A lot of the internet connections here in America are gimped in really weird ways, but um, and like upload is one of them. Mm -hmm. And so it can be problematic to stream from like if you're traveling, like stream your home media collection. Mm -hmm. But Plex actually makes that really easy, and I think that like movie studios and rights holders are really nervous about that kind of functionality and I hope that it doesn't go away but being able to record those kind of things from traditional mediums like a time and format shift it basically has been really awesome but I find I'm, you know I don't really have a lot of time to enjoy that kind of stuff anymore mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Netflix is good enough that it's you know it's it has broken and it's like okay I need to probably figure out why it's broken or updated or whatever and I just haven't bothered but the thing about all of these streaming services is, you know, Disney's coming out with a new one this year, Apple. What's the one for Star Trek? CBS? Yep, and Warner's got one coming out. Yeah, that I'm getting a bit fatigued by all this stuff. I don't really like the idea of not being able to get back to that either because, like, I have archived copies of Next Gen, but I also have, like, the, the resampled whatever uh, thing of Star Trek Next Gen, and I really like the idea of format shifting from the newer formats onto something that I can watch on Plex all the time. Because, mm -hmm. like, what's on Netflix is not, I don't think it's the the resampled version. It doesn't seem like it's the resampled version. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, things could disappear off of Netflix at any at any given moment. Like, oh, House is here today, now it's gone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was talk of them removing friends, and people went crazy about that. <laughs> it's really all about the rights. You know, the, each different one of these streaming services wants to have that exclusive content. And so if, if for some reason CBS did the calculation and said, you know, we make more money if we take Star Trek off of Netflix, they could do it. I don't know why culturally this has become okay. It's like, oh, Catcher in the Rye is no longer available. What? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a weird, like, it makes the product inconsistent, and it seems like it's going to drive piracy. Yeah. It's a worse it's a worse situation than we were in with discs ten years ago. 
Yeah. You know, because if I have a disc on my shelf, I know that I'm going to have that disc on my shelf. <laughs> well, I now don't because I've ripped them all and put them in Plex. Well, but. that's the person who does that is the person who is the most advantaged now. People who have pirated and created a huge content or like me, I, I, I bought like all of the Star Trek stuff on Blu-ray when it came out on Blu-ray, bought it all on DVD. And each time I've ripped it and I'm just sort of done doing that too and just getting exhausted by it. Yeah. So you got a Plex server. How much storage is that on? Uh, I think it's only about 20 terabytes, hmm. give or take. So okay. not, not, it's not, you know, exorbitant, but um, there's need- also like production VM backups and some other mm-hmm. things there. Mm-hmm. We need a, a leaderboard of different ge- <laughs> guests, Plex storage. Yeah. You know, like the Top Gear lap board. Yeah, we should have that with... Uh, that would be. <laughs> well, if you, if you don't mind software-defined storage, I could allocate a pool here. I mean, we could probably go like... Up into the petabyte range. Ooh. That'd be <laughs> oh, okay. The leaderboard. <laughs> okay. Wendell's just shot straight to the top. <laughs> I love it. It's going to be hard to beat that so, for a while. <laughs> just coming back to your home assistant, when, when I say home assistant, I mean the Python project that's all about home automation. Oh, you, yeah. You clearly mean something different. Yeah. No. Well, the uh, I want to tie all of that in because the Python personal assistant is also about things like Uh, You know, for a while I had a scanner by the door. Mm. And so like I could, like I got mail and I could just feed it through the scanner and it looks at the image. Like I don't have to tell it what it is. It knows, like it knows the time of day and it knows this looks like an electric bill and OCR is good enough that it'll just categorize that online. So like if you've ever used OneNote or Evernote or something like that online and you organize everything temporally, you can just put that there, tag it, electric bill, whatever. And then I don't have to think about organizing it. It just does it for me. Mm. Those kinds of things, like a lot of people put a lot of work into organizing those aspects of their lives. Technology can do it, but nobody's really doing it in, in terms of like a product. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can see that being super valuable for you as an RVA to have a, a PO box or something with a, an AI system or machine learning system sorting this mail. It's something I've thought about because there's some services where humans will do it, but it's quite a bit. It's quite a yeah, bit my, to... my mother-in-law in England sorts my British mail. <laughs> <laughs> See, I need one of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just scan it, get it in the computer, and and th- that kind of stuff is really easy to automate at the command line. I mean, just a little bit of Python and a little bit of image recognition, and even like the barcode recognition. There's some really good optical barcode recognition libraries out there. Mm. You'd be surprised what you can bang out in a weekend. Really, and but uh, some of that though does sound like it relies on. Some service, like at some point, you have to have something that's intelligent enough to sort and store this stuff. Well, you, you can still do all of that locally because mm. you can sort of tag it yourself. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I have the the Tesla V100s is I want to do that also with like the video component. And I think that they're like OpenCV and some of the the open source libraries now are good enough that you can train your own neural network to do these things. And I've got the old data set so that I can just be like, here is the last three years of electric bills. This, this is what an electric bill looks like. Yeah. Just do it. Huh. That is a, that, so it's, there's, there's compelling reasons in, in, in that argument. There's compelling reasons to start capturing now, even if you don't have the recognition system in place yet. Yeah. And uh, Python is also really easy to automate. And so like some of the same web technologies we use for QA and QC, things like, it's not PhantomJS anymore because PhantomJS is on its way out. But you can do browser automation and look for things. And so you can like automate the login thing for the electric company because like, you can get an electronic version of your bill now, but it changes a little bit, and sometimes the system is inaccessible, and sometimes you can't get more than six months of bills and blah, blah, blah. You could just automate that and have it log in and do stuff. And then if it can't log in because they changed the website or whatever, then you can have it notify you to be like, hey, I couldn't download, mm-hmm. download the bill or, or whatever. Or I couldn't find the amount that was due because they changed the name of the, the div or whatever it is. And that's not even AI. That's just you know your good old-fashioned uh, web dev quality of control workflow. Sure. So you said when I when I when I started asking you about your home setup, you said you do keep it kind of lean. Is that almost a philosophical thing? Yeah, I don't really like data storage. Like the data storage that I have, I have files that go back to like the '90s. Hmm. But um, other than storage and and replicas, I used to have I used to have one full rack at home. But by and large, between virtual machine consolidation and just not wanting to do the maintenance for it it's really become super, super consolidated. Like all these little experiments and all these other little things, they run in containers. And right now my home setup is using Docker, but uh, the home, the everything at, at work pretty much is, almost everything is, has moved to, to Kubernetes because Kubernetes on bare metal has also gotten a lot better in the last six months or so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so because everything is containerized, 
I have much better separation of the stuff that's mine that I want to hang on to and stuff that's just a transient thing that I put together to try to deal with whatever it is. Are you the sort of guy, because you mentioned a few of your servers have Proxmox on them and a few of them have ESXi. At home, what do you do? Are you, are you bare metal at home with just containers on there or uh, VMs? Or? At home, it's actually Beehive. So, yeah, I mean... Okay, tell us why, because <laughs> uh, Chris just did a double, a double take on that one. I wanted, to, I wanted to experiment with it, but I didn't trust it with production workloads yet. Fair enough. So... Um, Good way to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's like, okay, will this will this actually run? And I think that's part of why some of the things are broken. I think is because that <laughs> that it was like, oh, I probably I don't know if this is ready for that. I don't I don't know if maybe. So Beehive is what the KVM equivalent for BSD. Yep. From yeah. Okay. So that answer that answers the OS you're running then. Yeah, that was an, and actually that started out as a free BSD installation that or I mean a free NAS installation that became free BSD. And so that one became FreeBSD unwillingly. Like uh, it was FreeBSD, or it was FreeNAS, and then they did that upgrade that had like the, yes. the web GUI. Yes. And that actually, like, I feel really bad for that developer because that was actually a brilliant interface, and it was great, and it was exactly the right idea. It was necessary too, but but boy. the inertia of everything else, it was just impossible. Yeah, and I hope they bring that back because that was actually a good idea. But um, I do believe actually they are working on a new one. The uh, that went wrong for me, and then so then it became FreeBSD. It's funny. My <laughs> free NAS systems are no longer free NAS systems either. I uh, went a little more extreme. I, I moved them to Fedora, which was much more of a process. Oh, yeah, the level one server, that's what we did. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, once it's ZFS, yeah. it, the data is safe, and then you just got to get it working on Fedora. And I, some, thought, I thought that's what you were going to say, by the way. I thought you were going to say you had Fedora at home. In some cases, ZFS on Linux is now ahead of yeah. the BSD yeah. fork. Yeah. yeah. Isn't, hasn't that been something to watch? It has, yeah. It's been a lot of fun. Have we got memory compression yet? That's the thing I'm waiting for. If if they do, it's uh, it's not not in any of my systems. So Chris has a direct line to Alan Jude. We can find yeah. out. <laughs> Alan, add that. No, he's yeah, he is actually really involved with it these days. I, I think that's I think that is a feature that he added. I just don't know where where mm-hmm. it's available yet. Mm-hmm. But the uh, m- the memory arc compression uh, data set compression thing that is going to be a game changer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you're all ZFS at home as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's the only file system I trust. Really? Yeah. So how do, how do you square off? Because at home, a lot of people, I mean, I'm looking around this room full of hard drives and to paint a picture for people, we're, we're in we're in Wendell's office today. And uh, it's just, it's, an, it's Willy Wonka for nerds, this place. It's like, <laughs> it's amazing. But for a lot of people, they, they want to add, you know, one or two hard drives a year to their system and stuff like that. Like one of the biggest issues I face at home, certainly with uh, using ZFS, is that expansion, the, the lack of flexibility. Like, wh- What do you think about that? So I, I ran up against that m- myself. I mean, you know, you remember like my home server is an ITX system that's only got six three and a half inch hard drive bays. It's the Fractal Node 304. Nice. And so uh, I started out with, I think, three, three terabyte drives. And then I bought three eight terabyte drives. So it was two VDEVs um, of RAID Z1, so one, dr- one drive could die. But I realized that when I, um, and I, you know, everything's good, but I realized when I was putting the eight terabyte drives in, and those when eight terabyte drives were new and kind of expensive, and it's like, I don't want to buy just one drive because that's like losing eight terabytes of information would be a huge pain. And uh, RAID 1 is not economical enough because I have to buy twice as much to have the redundancy. But if I get three drives, it, is, it literally splits the middle of costs and mm-hmm. risk. And so it's like, all right, I'll get three eight terabyte drives. So I got three eight terabyte drives, and I was just going to add it as a VDEV so that I could have, you know, six plus 16, and that would be pretty good. But then as I was doing that, I was like, well, wait, I could probably just set up another uh, Z pool and move everything off of the old one and then have the free slots and just keep doing this three drive square dance because at home, I don't, you know, at most, I would have like four or five hard drives. And so is it unreasonable economically for me to buy four or five hard drives at a time for, you know, doubling my storage every time? And it's like, eh, as long as the market technology continues, probably not. Mm-hmm. I think that is that is the exact calculation I make with CFS. If, if I'm willing to buy two or three drives at a time, then it's a it's a perfect fit for me for expansion. And I think if, you know, you just got to make that math calculation. And you decided because of the rate you want to add drives, it might be just too much. And you, wanna, you also want to like do mismatch drives, don't you? Like ones you take out of production and put in there. Well, that's that's an important consideration with the VDEV calculations and things like mm-hmm. that. You have to pretty much run the same size, same make, same brand, ideally performance-wise of drives in each VDEV. 
So I, I use a merger FS and basically it's JBOD plus snap raid for parity because a lot of my data sets are just very large static files that you write once, read a few times. But I can imagine if you're doing bursty workloads like VM storage or any kind of database work that that you might run up against some limits because you've mentioned something about Optane today oh, yeah. whilst we were talking. And I, I, I mean, I've heard Linus Tech Tips talk about this and I just don't really know what it does. It's eventually it should be cheaper than Flash. It's one of those technologies that is really good. It seems like it's less complicated than Flash, but we're entering an era where you've got like five or six bits per cell with Flash, and so the density is going to be hard hard to compete with there. But as I understand the manufacturing for um, for Optane, it's you know a three D. Uh, it's basically a three D phase change thing. Like it's just a couple of sheets of silicon. Uh, with a phase change layer between them. I'm, I'm, I'm grossly oversimplifying. Mm. But that type of manufacturing seems like it would be orders of magnitude simpler than NAND flash manufacturing. And then you add in the fact that the throughput is not there yet. Well, you can fix that by adding more devices. But the latency is about halfway between NAND flash and DRAM. And so that's one of the reasons I think Intel is pushing Optane as a DRAM alternative. But the fly in the ointment for them there is that AMD has shown up and said, uh, we don't really care. You want to run non-volatile memory? No problem. You want to run eight terabytes of memory on a two-socket system? No problem. We don't care. Whatever you want to do. And so Intel's like, oh, man, we got these separate SKUs for, like, more memory. Darn. I mean, oh, we were going to try like try to do some market segmentation there or something like that. Because some of those large databases, these, these companies will pay any amount of money to make their database run faster because it literally translates into more money for them. Yeah. And so having the database run from Optane, whether implemented as memory, as DRAM, or implemented as a storage device, um, enables those kinds of workloads in a way that the DRAM can't. But uh, there, like Samsung and other companies have done a lot of work on their NAND devices to hide a lot of the latency, very efficient caching algorithms, mixing flash types, on a particular device and, and, and those kinds of things really uh, solve the problem for a lot of workloads, but not the workloads where the companies are willing to pay just obscene amounts of money. And so I think that is one place where ZFS could improve a whole lot is much more intelligent um, caching for some of those workloads. I mean, you get the, you get the ZIL and, and the L2 arc, but you know, it's still the case that just adding a whole bunch more memory is generally better than mm -hmm. than more um, than more L2 arc. And so we're in a situation now where you can get Optane uh, or as a DIM, so you're literally quote unquote adding more RAM, or you can get Optane as a storage device, and then you're adding RAM on disk. Hmm. But I mean, I'm seeing videos where people are building entirely flash based servers now. Yeah. So the actual storage array is as fast now as the caches used to be. Yeah. Yeah. Which is insane. <laughs> yeah. Some of that, especially for like video editing, the random scrub ability is really good. Although my my little setup with its scrappy NAND flash and 128 gigs of memory and spinning rust with an intelligent and tiering cache policy, I would put up against a lot of those flash servers. A lot mm. of the, a lot of the flash servers, especially the DIY servers, like you know, like the Jellyfish all flash server, for example. Mm -hmm. I think that the software is just too dumb because like my old school NetApp disk shelves with an intelligent tiering system for video editing will match the performance of an all flash storage while being orders of magnitude less expensive for mm -hmm. bulk storage. Is that custom software they designed to figure that out? or is No, I think uh, there, there, a lot of the enterprise software for tiered storage has already solved this problem a long time ago. Mm -hmm. We just haven't seen anybody apply it in this space. Um, I'm, I'm working with the Inmodus guys to try to figure out a way we can demonstrate it because the Inmodus product on Linux is actually quite good. You can go in and tag files and be like, this is part of the fast tier, this is part of the fast tier, this is part of the fast tier, and it'll do it. So if you combine, like for a video editor, if you combine your video ingest workload with um, that, a little bit of shell scripting, basically. So I'm going to ingest videos from the camera. It's like, oh, we probably need those, those to be part of the fast here. Right. And then you look at like A time, and it's like, oh, those probably should definitely be part of the fast here. Or you just give an editor control. Like an editor can go create an empty text file in a folder to be like, make this project hot. And then you know you do that on a Friday, and you come in Monday, 
And the system will have automatic, it's like, oh, I need to make everything in this folder part of the fast here and just do it. That's like five lines of shell scripting, but I, I'm I'm 100% sure that that is going to be as fast as a quote unquote all flash storage solution. Interesting. That makes a huge difference, it sounds like. And it's really cool. So I've seen stuff like that. Um, my day job's working with OpenShift, mm. um, a Kubernetes enterprise distro. Um, and I see a lot of stuff in there around storage classes, about how you can you know, specify a flash array for this right. workload and a spinning. So it's, this sounds like a, a really... The poor man's version. <laughs> well, not necessarily poor man's, but yeah, like if it works, yeah, great. You yeah. Know? yeah, and you can do it at the individual folder level too, which is really cool. I yeah. want to implement some of this stuff in my Proxmox setup now, so we'll have to <laughs> <laughs> share a Git repo or something. <laughs> it would be a lot of fun, yeah. Hmm. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk maybe a bit more about younger Wendell, if that's if that's okay. <laughs> that's fine. I'm interested to know a little bit about what got you interested in technology in the first place. Like, what was your first? Can you remember what was your first computer? Um, it was probably it was probably the a LaserPal 8086 or possibly a Tandy 286. So awesome. like the, the LaserPal was like a luggable, and the Tandy was um uh. It was like a business machine, but it had problems. Like mm-hmm. it needed to be repaired. And so, uh, the thing that you have to understand is like where I grew up was like super poor and like ten years in the past. So a lot of the technology, like I have fond memories of like the IBM XT and the PC sixty three hundred and uh, the AT T PC sixty three hundred, which is really amazing, and like the Tandy TL two and even the TRS eighty. But a lot of these computers were not current when I was using them because, you know, a lot of businesses would like donate the, like there were still tax loopholes. And so it's like their garbage computers would end up in like poor schools and in like the poorer parts of the country. And so I got to play with a lot of that stuff, but also because it was garbage, I wasn't afraid to like tinker with it and break it worse, but more often than not, I could actually fix it. So um, (laughs) there was a guy that ran a junk store and he knew that I had a knack for fixing things, not just computers, but like other stuff. And so he had somebody come and pick me up every weekend and, uh, and in summers and would bring me to the junk store. And so I would work on fixing stuff at the junk store. And so he would buy like, you know, the return truck from Sears. Like, you know, the thing on Amazon now that's really popular. Like, it's like yeah. oh, I bought a $1,000 of just random returns from Amazon. So you used to do that in, in the late 80s, early 90s. You know, you would do that. A tractor trailer at a time with like Sears and like you'd bid on it. And so he would do that. And then there would, there would inv- invariably be random technology on there. And it's like, Oh look, I fixed this fax machine. And he's like, great, let's sell it at the junk store. It was like, Oh look, I fixed this other thing. And it's like, Oh yeah, sell it at the junk store. So, uh, between that and the school stuff, uh, it was a lot of fun, like learning how to fix the stuff and put it together and, and that kind of thing. I got the, 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 there was a Tandy that had uh, bad sectors on the hard drive. And so like, if you just did like a regular DOS install, the DOS install would fail because it it could, it was near the beginning of the disc, but it wasn't at the, at the very beginning of the disc. And so like, I had to figure out how to low level format the thing and there was no manual for it. And uh, it was like, it was just completely, our local library had a book called the Win Rosh Hardware Bible. Which had like, I mean, you got to, I get a feel for the photographers. Like, it's like, you know, you get the photographer for the book and like this guy shows up and it's like, we need like this super technical book about like component level repair of like the IBM PC XT. And it's just like some old balding guy. And it's like, okay, well, let's just, let's put a keyboard in their lap and take a picture of it. And so that, that is the Win Rosh hardware Bible. And so I, I carted that thing around for years. Boy, you'd love to get your hands on a copy of that again. Still have it here somewhere. Do you? Yeah. Good. Good for you. That's <laughs> it's, that's great holding on to that kind of stuff. That guy was uh, clever to uh, snatch you up. Sounds like you made a good chunk of change off of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was, a, that was a lot of fun. Uh, later, I went to work for the company that um, fixed computers for the, uh, the school system. So that was fun. Mm. The, uh, the thing that got their attention. So IBM Model M keyboards, if you're really hard on them, will develop a short in the cable. So it's like foil wrapped. I mean, typical IBM over engineering. It's like uh, it's like the rubberized plastic, and then like a hard plastic, like a, almost like a plastic bag plastic, but like the hard cellophane, and then foil, and then individual wires. And if you like yank the cord, it will break the insulation 
on the wires inside the foil, and then they'll touch the foil and short out. Mm. There's a through hole, there's a green through hole fuse on the motherboard that will blow whenever that you have a keyboard that has that type of a short. And so at a school, it's like, we don't want to replace the keyboard. This keyboard almost works. And the keyboard will work as long as the keyboard is in the right spot. And then it mysteriously stops working. And it's like, that's weird. Let me try this keyboard on another computer. It's like, oh, it's not working on this one either. Now, both of those have a blown fuse. Mm-hmm. So um, the replacement cost for a school that could not afford it was like $900 for the motherboard. Oh, my goodness. And I was like, dude, we can just replace the fuse. And they're like, one, if you're a sense. student, what are you doing? Yeah. Two, uh, OMG, WTF, BBQ. And I was like, all right, well, just hire me. Like, why can't I work for you? And it was like lots of angry adults yelling at one another. And then like, all right, we're going to hire you. <laughs> Had a very similar experience in my, my school years. Very similar to that. That's great. <laughs> the adults were very uncomfortable with it at first. They didn't know what to do about this kid that was coming around fixing stuff. Very, very uncomfortable. There, there was a, there were, I, there were two of us at the school. So I, you know, I had, a, I had a cohort and he's doing, he's doing really well and all the stuff that he's doing, but the uh, the really amazing thing with that is we deployed Linux. Uh, by the time I was a senior in high school, uh, Linux was just bare. It was like zero point nine two. What uh, was the job it was doing? Uh, net network address translation. That's what I had my Linux box do, and also a proxy server. Yeah. <laughs> so the school had a token ring, and uh, the new computers that were coming in were Ethernet, mm-hmm. and so there was just no. Mm-hmm. There was no internet access Ooh, on the school with Ethernet. With, with <laughs> Ethernet, yeah, I mean Ethernet. Was, well, it was it was kind of dumb because they were like, "Well, 16 meg is faster on paper, so that's got to be better than 10 meg Ethernet." And it's just like, what, <laughs> what? No. <laughs> Me and the other student, like between the two of us, we sort of figured out how we could do IP translation between a network. It was called IP masquerading at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, so that the Ethernet computers could get on the token ring network through. That basically, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. That was a crazy amount of fun. And uh, like the guy that was in charge of all of the technology for the entire state came and he's like, You know, I just uh, this is good what you've done, it's fine, but you know, without annoyance, it's like, But we can't have an unsupportable solution in schools, like it just it's it'll cost too much money. No one, no one, any, no one here has any idea how this works except for you, mm-hmm. and it like we can't we can't do this, we have to buy the proper equipment. And it's like, all right, well, you know, we can have a bake sale or something. What is the proper equipment to do this? And he explained what it was. And I was like, all right, how much is that? And he's like, well, I think the state has a contract for that for like 10 grand. And I was like, 10 grand? And I was like, if a couple of kids can do this with junk computers, don't you think it's worth your time to learn how to do this? Because you'd save 10 grand to school and you got a lot of schools. Yeah. He was, his ears turned red. Yeah, that's so funny. So we had a situation where the schools were very, very excited to implement 802.11. B, I think it was, it was two megabits, and that's how they did all of the interlinks between the schools, because otherwise they'd have to pay for lines from the telcos, which were just ridiculous. And when they put the whole wireless network in, nobody thought to segment up the different schools, so it was one flat network. <laughs> oh my! What God. could go wrong? So like print jobs were routing through the central district building and back out to the schools over a two meg link. And so we built a series of uh, Debian-based servers to essentially solve the problem and Microsoft found out. And this is back this is back in the like the uh, you know the days of uh, monopoly. So it was they were wow. they were rough players and they they assembled a meeting with the adults and they came in playing hardball and said we want you to use this thing it's called NT5 it's in development right now and it can do exactly what that Linux box is doing. <laughs> you want us to put a beta in when this is working just fine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a really interesting time. It was so early. It was the same story. It's an unsupportable product. Yeah. And now it just it would be just totally normal. What's really funny is that uh, all of those computers were IBM computers, and IBM has literally become the poster child of Linux support. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh boy, that is, <laughs> there's some irony there too, huh? <laughs> something, something, Red Hat. <laughs> <laughs> Alex will say nothing for the segment of the show. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah, it really, it, when you look back at it like that, you did have to kind of fight some, miscon- I don't know, misconceptions is the right word, but you had to push through some of that. Yeah, they did eventually replace that system with a, uh, a, a solution based on Microsoft Proxy Server. Mm-hmm. And was that on NT4 at the time? Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. And it was garbage. Yeah. It was unadulterated garbage. That's why they wanted us to use it first. And we said, no, it's too much garbage. We, did, we tried NT4 first, 
And then they're like, okay, we'll use the beta, use NT5, which ended up being Windows 2000. They never even called it NT5, but back then that's what they were calling it. The the people, like the state level people, even came in to like test it and like oversee it and make sure everything went smooth with the replacement. And they had, you know, test systems set up side by side. And it's like, here's here's the old system. Look how much faster and better the new system is. And just like loading web pages was dramatically slower. It was astonishingly slower. Yeah. Could you could you picture doing what you do now in that era of the internet? No. I would have probably gone, like, they would have had to put me away for homicide because it was just like, this is like the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've lost our ability to think clearly. Yeah. It's pretty incredible that the internet enables you in <laughs> quote unquote rural Kentucky to operate an internet based business that you have. Was it quarter of a million subscribers or something on YouTube? Yeah. These days. Uh, it's the technology really has changed the world. And, and, and I think humanity is only really just beginning to grasp what the internet's capable of with remote work. And well, Arthur C. Clarke said that, you know, and not in this generation, but next generation referring to us, I think that probably in our lifetime, we will see a sea change reversal in the value of property. City property will become worth less than rural property because you could work anywhere. Mm -hmm. So long as you have a good link. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is also that, that meta story is what is driving us to do this show now is the home solutions like you touched on are as good as what Google can run in their data centers now. Yeah. That's mind blowing. Well, I mean, it's a question of resources. Like Google wants you to have the tiniest slice ever. The, the, I mean, like even the serverless slice, like Amazon wants you to come up with a way to do right. your thing serverlessly mm -hmm. because their margin on the serverless thing is better even than EC2. And the, their margins are a hundred percent on EC2. I mean, I've worked on some very large projects and trying to figure out like the Amazon cost to the business when you when you've always got a background hum of customers and then you have like the burstiness and you're going to rely on Amazon for the burstiness, your cost on Amazon is a hundred percent of what you would pay for bare metal hardware. The question is just optimizing the curve so that you know you have you're going to have a little bit overbuilt in for your your local infrastructure, but for those you know those those. Uh, things that are like two standard deviations away from average, then you can rely on Amazon and it makes economic sense. And yeah, you're paying Amazon money hand over fist, but you didn't have to do the capital investment for the other part. So it probably makes sense. Yep. And I think that's Amazon's, or uh, I think that's even Netflix's model. That is the thing. It's a CapEx. Uh, it's not CapEx, it's OpEx. Yeah. So people can write it off every quarter instead of one big mm -hmm. chunk up front. Mm -hmm. And I've actually managed to get uh, quite a lot of traction with C-level people with that kind of maths, you know, and say to them, look, it's going to save you money. You can write this off every quarter instead. So just before we sat down, Wendell, you mentioned something about Eric S. Raymond having an invitation only basement that he can do hacker projects in. Yeah. This is always something that's, that's really fascinating is, and and something I've been on the, on the lookout for, you know, real estate wise is I'm not in the, I'm not, I'm not in a position to do it now, but he always tells us stories about um, people that have come to stay with him and not really exactly mentors, but people that would be able to work on their projects in his basement. So like his, his basement is basically a separate apartment, but you have access to Eric Raymond upstairs. So it's like, I want to work on this thing or I want to learn about this thing or I want to do whatever. So it's a really sort of fascinating situation. It's like a it's like a little mini makers lab with uh, Eric Raymond upstairs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean that 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 kind of thing is just is just fascinating. So it's it's you know that that kind of thing might work really well in terms of doing some other stuff. Well, before we go, Wendell, we should do the obligatory pluggy plugs. I bet everybody knows where to find you, but where should we send people? Um, level and the number one text.com. And then you can get to Twitter or the YouTube channel or wherever from there. I mean, it, it doesn't really, you can just Google level one Wendell and it's fine. It, it works. I've tested that. <laughs> At tech Wendell on Twitter, I believe. Yes. Okay. Yes. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Yeah. Are well, we, thanks not only for uh, joining us, but thanks for hosting us too. It's been oh, great no worries. The tour. It's been it's been interesting. I hope it was worth the eight hour drive. I mean, <laughs> uh, well, yeah. thanks to the snake, it was the snake was the <laughs> yeah, snake I made it so. all. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you haven't seen Rule. Like if you, it, we could go about three hours off the beaten path, and then you'll be like, holy smokes! Really? Yeah, that'd be something. It's scary. Well, you can find us um, on Twitter at self hosted show. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris is at Chris Las. Thank you, sir. What uh, about you? And I'm there on 
Twitter with at Ironic Badger. And don't forget to send us your show questions. We'll get those into the show soon when we're done traveling. Hashtag ask SSH. Self-hosted.show slash two. Thank you.